Okay, um, I have two o'clock here in Argentina. So uh, Elena is at 9 a.m. in San Diego and we have a our fabulous speaker today, Federica, joining. But right before we start, just very briefly, I would like to welcome you and remind you of our aims, which is to benefit and inspire immunologists across the world in an egalitarian manner and have access to these incredible scientific talks without the need of traveling. Of course, we could not have done this without uh, the generosity of all the speakers that we had along the year. These are the two posters for our Global Immuno Talks this year. Today is our last talk of the year, so very special to be together today, uh, celebrating, in a sense, this last talk of uh, 2020. So welcome, everybody. I will now like to ask my co-organizer and dear friend, Elina Soniga, to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Federica Salusto. Thank you. Thank you, Carly. It is indeed a very, very special day, and uh, I couldn't be more pleased uh, to introduce to you for this uh, last Global Immuno Talk of 2020, Dr. Federica Salusto. And so Federica was born in uh, Naples, Italy, uh, although most of her career uh, was done in Switzerland. Uh, so after high school, she studied biology at uh, Sapienza University of Rome, uh, where she graduated with cum laude. And so from early on, she was an outlier, really. Uh, she then uh, performed postdoctoral training at the Italian National Institute of Health in Rome. And uh, after that, she moved to Switzerland as a visiting scientist in, at the Basel Institute for Immunology. And then she became member at the same institute. And it was uh, there at, in Switzerland, uh, really, where uh, Federica established her independent scientific career and uh, made all the amazing discoveries she communicated and earned her international recognition as uh, a, a, a scientist. Um, in 2000, she became a group leader and quickly moved through the ranks. And Federica is currently professor of medical immunology at the ETH Zurich and at the Università della SB Serana Italiana in Lugano. She has a joint professorship. Uh, she's also group leader of the Cellular Immunology Laboratory at the Institute for Research in Biomedicine in Bellisona and director of the Center of Medical Immunology at the same institute. So I don't think that anyone will question that Federica has made a number of really, really impactful uh, discoveries that shaped the field of immunology, particularly uh, the study of human immunology. Uh, she's an expert uh, in the study of human cellular immunology. Her research has focused on dendritic cells and T cell traffic, mechanisms of T cell differentiation and immunological uh, memory. Just to, we cannot name all the discoveries, but just to name a few, uh, her uh, uh, research has revealed, for example, a differential expression of chemokine receptors in Th1, Th2, and Th17 cells, and led to the characterization of central memory and effector memory T cells as memory subsets with distinct migra migratory capacity and effector function that I think was a discovery that really shaped the study of immunological T cell memory. So other contributions from uh, Federica's teams include the discovery of Th22 cells as a distinct subset of skin homing T cells, the characterization of non-classical Th1 cells induced by bacteria, and the uh, description of two distinct types of pathogen-specific Th17 cells with pro-inflammatory and regulatory properties. And I'm sure we will learn more about these discoveries. And I heard also some unpublished uh, uh, research that Federica will share with us today. So for all uh, these contributions, 
uh, she received, as you may imagine, a uh, numerous awards, uh, and uh, those include, uh, but are not limited to, uh, the Pharmacy Allergy Research Foundation Award, the Bering Lecture Prize, the Science Award uh, from the Foundation for the Study of Neurodegenerative Diseases that she received in 2010. Federica uh, was also elected member of the German Academy of Science Leopoldina in 2009 and of EMBO in 2011 and is currently the president-elect of the European Federation of Immunological Societies. So it is uh, difficult to imagine a better speaker for closing the 2020 Global Immuno Talks uh, today. Uh, your seminal contributions, uh, Federica, to the field of immunology have earned uh, so rightfully the global recognition uh, uh, in the immunology community and also place you as a, an inspirational uh, role model for women scientists in many areas, but also in immunology. Uh, so we could not be more delighted and honored to have you uh, today as our last global immuno speaker of 2020. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Ellie and Carla, for the very kind invitation. It's really First of all, uh, I want to, to thank you for organizing such great talks. I know that my fellows in the lab love them, uh, and I think it was a great idea to maintain the connection in these difficult times. And I am def definitely delighted to be here closing this series uh, and wishing you success for the next one, uh, for next year. Um, so thank you again for, for the kind invitation. I look forward to show some of our previous work, and as you mentioned, also some um, unpublished work we have been doing recently. Fantastic, and we cannot wait either, but we'll wait a few minutes more because um, uh, we, we always ask a question to the global immuno speakers to let to know them a little bit better and learn from their experience. And, and so the question we have prepared for you today, Federica, is what is the trait in your personality that helped you the most in your scientific career? Um, well, I should say that there was um, certainly the passion for this work. I mean, I really, when I entered the first time in the lab as a student, I felt that that is my place. I feel I felt home. And then maybe also um, some lack of confidence, I should say. I mean, always thinking that you can do better, that you can learn from others, uh, that uh, you can always improve. Uh, this, I think, also helps a lot, always. Um, I mean, one self-confidence is something that can help, of course, in your career, especially if you are a, a female. Um, um, but uh, I would say always thinking that there is room for improvement and that you can, you can listen and learn from others is very important and be always open-minded. Uh, there is so much to learn and so much to, to learn from others, especially. Yeah, okay. that, that, that's very helpful. I, I, I agree with that uh, fully. I think that confidence is important, but being humbled also to, to, to learn from others is, is key, is key, right? Yeah. Um, okay, Federica, if uh, you could share your screen. I start sharing my screen. Okay, uh, okay. so share screen, okay. And then you just need to tell me if you see well my screen. Uh, yes, that's uh, uh, yeah. the question. The question that more po most popular in this period, <laughs> and then I also Stop. need to just to to have the laser pointer on. So um, here we are. Um, so um, my talk will be on human T cells mainly, and the studies we have been doing. Um, in this context. And let me just uh, starting very, very broadly. Uh, this is not the audience to be so, so broad, but just uh, to set up the stage uh, by saying that, of course, the immune system has evolved to protect the host against uh, a, a, the attack of countless uh, microorganisms. And T lymphocytes in particular cope with this diversity by generating an extraordinarily diverse um, number of, of receptors that can recognize uh, microbial antigenic peptides in the context of cell molecules. And when a naive T cell encounters its cognate antigen, it also undergoes clonal expansion 
and uh, uh, differentiating one of several T cell lineages. And really the heterogeneity in the context of the CD4 T cell lineage, the heterogeneity of this um, uh, differentiation or the possibility to uh, differentiate along multiple paths um, can provide the tailor mechanisms of protection against the different pathogens. And what the, the naive cell uh, undergo during this differentiation process is the acquisition of, uh, um, so in particular, the ability to produce effector cytokines. Uh, and together with the acquisition of effector cytokines, uh, these differentiating T helper cells also acquire different migratory capacities. Uh, and so that uh, is simplified by the fact that uh, the cells also acquire a different expression of homey receptors. And we have learned with time uh, that uh, there is a lot of heterogeneity, but certainly there are some main pathways of differentiation uh, that um, deal with the uh, effector T cells that best serve the function to protect against viruses, parasites, fungi, or uh, intercellular and extracellular bacteria. And they, we've been using a lot of chemokine receptors are convenient surface markers to define these different types of T helper cells, TH1, TH2, and TH17, for instance. But the, the use of chemokine receptor has also helped us defining two flavors of TH1 cells, and uh, that both express the chemokine receptor 6 or 3 but in addition, one subset can be identified through the co-expression of CCR6, which is a chemokine receptor uh, typical of TH17 cells. Um, so these uh, two types of TH1 cells, both expressing interferon gamma, um, are particularly interesting because apparently uh, they respond to different pathogens. So this, the subset of CXR3 positive classic TH1 cells would be particularly rich in T cells responding to viral antigens, whereas the uh, TH1 star subset expressing CXR3 together with CCR6 um, is particularly enriched in T cells that can recognize uh, bacterial antigens and in particular mycobacteria and I will come back to that uh, in a minute. So the talk today really um, want to focus on two main aspects uh, that I alluded to in the first slide. So the specificity of the T cells, how we can study that in humans, and the function of the T cells, which are induced by different pathogens. And we are doing so by analyzing the T cell response to pathogens in individuals that are exposed to pathogens in vivo, and then uh, analyzing this response in different conditions um, of a chronic or acute infection in, in also different type of pathologies, for instance, in autoimmunity, but also in patients with immunodeficiency that affect the generation of one or the other cell type. So how we, we study human T cells, uh, we are of course sometimes limited in the ability to perform experiments uh, in the context of human immunology. But um, as I mentioned, we really like to study what has been induced in vivo by analyzing uh, T cells which have been primed in vivo and therefore we focus on effector or memory T cells. Uh, we isolate and characterize memory T cell subset. This was a study, for instance, leading to the characterization of central memory and effector memory memory T cells in humans. We perform antigen-induced simulation to study T cells which are induced by certain antigens. We also develop a method of high throughput screening of T cell libraries to interrogate the memory repertoire in a high throughput fashion and using the same method actually also to study naive T cells. And then we have been using, I would say, a precursor of the uh, single cell RNA-6 um, uh, um, method, which is, you know, isolating a single T cell clone. So this is something we have been doing uh, for the past 30 years. And this, you know, the T cell clone represents a, a single unit with a, a one single T cell receptor that you can study in a sort of, at least for the specificity, would represent a, a unit. And then, of course, we are also using uh, more modern technologies like proteomic, peptidomics. So we perform a lot of these receptor an uh, analysis uh, through um, high throughput uh, sequencing. And then we also develop some uh, redu reductionist type of approaches to study um, T cell priming in vitro uh, by mixing at least the three essential elements uh, that are 
naive T cells and primed uh, T cells in the presence of professional antigen presenting cells, it can be, for instance, dendritic cells and the antigen, the microbe. And even if it's a very simple system, sometimes we realize that we can uh, obtain a cells in this very simple uh, approach that mimic to some extent those that we can study uh, ex vivo. Uh, and this, of course, is a convenient system to address uh, some mechanistic questions. So, and of course, when needed, we also use the mouse model that, of course, has the power of the genetic approach. So uh, the first study I want to share with you is about a study we have been doing recently, and this was really led by Antonino Gassotta, a PhD student at the time, to study the response to influenza uh, virus, and in particular to hemagglutinin. So what Antonino did was to obtain blood samples from several donors that undergo um, uh, influenza vaccination, uh, vaccination with the, with the influenza vaccine, and, uh, and use a, what is now more or less a standard approach we use in the lab, that is isolating, for instance, memory subsets based on the expression of chemokine receptors. So in this experiment, we isolate the central memory, effector memory, and circulating follicular helper cells based on the expression of CCL5, label the memory T cells with CFSC, and exposing them to different antigens, in this case, to the entire influenza vaccine or in a re-stimulatory fashion with hemagglutinin to enrich in hemagglutinin specific T cells. So you can, um, after a few days, you can very nicely uh, isolate and quantify uh, T cells that proliferate in response to the antigen you give in vitro, and you can perform single cell deposition and isolate really hundreds and hundreds of T cell clones specific for the antigen you have used uh, for the in vitro stimulation. And this is what is done here, um, where you should we see that we can um, have, uh, we have isolated more than a thousand T cell clones from four donors, all responding to the hemagglutinin. And so we can at that point, uh, with this very large panel of T cell clones responding to hemagglutinin from different donors ask the question, which is the antigen and which is the, the peptide that, that these uh, cells uh, uh, recognize. And one surprise uh, was that by analyzing in very much detail one donor, but was similar in also other three donors, that in spite of the fact that the hemagglutinin is quite a big protein, the response of the T cells in this particular donor, as, as I mentioned also in the others, was very focused towards a specific region. So in spite of having many possible peptides being generated by from hemagglutinin, the response was very much focused in this very small region. And as you can see, uh, there are several, if you clone and if you sequence, sorry, the T-cell receptor of the clones responding to these particular peptides, you see that there are many clones, so there is a sort of broad range of repertoire, but there are some clones which are immunodominant, so they are very highly expanded um, by by this uh, uh, antigenic simulation. And by sequencing uh, the uh, T cells that respond to the antigen in vitro um, and ex vivo memory subset, you can identify the specific uh, uh, T cell clones responding to this uh, peptide in the three memory subset and see that some of them are among the relatively highly expanded uh, in vivo. So you can even uh, detect the same T cell receptor with the same uh, T cell receptor di beta uh, sequence uh, in ex vivo samples. And you can track uh, the same clonotype over time. If you are able to get the blood samples, serial blood samples from the same donor, then you can see that the same uh, clonotypes uh, which are recognizing these uh, um, peptides can still be recovered um, 48 months after uh, vaccination. So these are um, highly expanded, um, um, highly, um, let's say, expanded and persistent with time in the three different compartments. So the question is, how is possible that the response is so focused? Was that because already in the naive repertoire there was such a bias? So at that point, we decided to use the piece of library approach that I was alluding to in the, in the, before uh, to study the specificity of naive cells responding to hemagglutinin. Uh, this sometimes is difficult in humans because the frequency is very low. And in fact, uh, when we um, study in the four donors, uh, the, we use the T-cell library approach to identify HA reactive T-cells in the native compartment, you see that we, did, we do find some T-cells that respond to this antigen, although the frequency, the number of dots, that means the number of cells responding, is much lower compared to the memory. And this is a 
a, a picture um, on the on the right hand side showing the frequency of uh, HRA active T cells in the naive and memory compartment. But that is still, we are able to isolate HA reactive naive T cells from the same donor and ask the question, are these naive T cells already uh, biased towards that particular peptide? And the answer is no. Actually, the naive repertoire, as you can see here, it can be recognized virtually any peptides from the hemagglutinin, um, while instead the, the memory cells, again, are focused towards this uh, region that we identified with the other method. So we have a very broad repertoire of naive T cells capable of recognizing any type of peptides, yet the memory or the effector and possibly the memory cells are, are becoming focused towards a few. So what can be the reason for such a focus? The reason that one possibility is, of course, that the peptide to which the effector and memory T cells are specific for may be preferentially produced by antigen presenting cells. And for that reason, Antonino performed uh, mass-based uh, peptidomics uh, to define the peptides which are presented by either uh, monocyte-derived dendritic cells or also uh, B cells specific for hemagglutinin, which are quite potent antigen-presenting cells, as you know. And again, uh, here, uh, these uh, type of experiments were quite telling, uh, um, confirming that in fact, the region which is very well um, seen by T cells is also the one that is best uh, um, produced in terms of peptide HLA molecule uh, by the monocyte derived dendritic cells as well as by B cells. So um, the, to summarize this work, which has been recently published, uh, we can say that naive T cells recognize a multiple peptides spanning almost entirely the hemagglutinin. Uh, and this would suggest that we have a broad repertoire of naive T cells, which is more maybe what, uh, what is expected. The naive T cells are really there to confer um, the possibility to recognize almost any type of, of peptide. Still, the memory T cells can, are focused to a few immunodominant peptides. Um, and this uh, um, would suggest also that there are some constraints in the ability of the immune system to generate relevant peptides for recognition. And one of these constraints can be, in fact, uh, uh, due to the antigen processing uh, step. And uh, we found at least that in the case of hemagglutinin and in the case of influenza uh, virus uh, antigens, uh, the antigen presenting cells, in fact, uh, dictates uh, apparently, at least the, the results will suggest the dictated type of memory T cells uh, which are then uh, remaining. And I, I didn't enter into much of the detail about also uh, the uh, role of uh, uh, proteases and the possibility to predict uh, better the um, peptides which are going to be loaded based also on the accessibility to proteases. Uh, but you can read this, uh, this study that, as I mentioned, was recently published. So, uh, needless to say that, as many other immunologists in the world, um, because of uh, SARS-CoV-2 emergency, we decided to take more or less the same type of approach to study um, the T-cell response in COVID-19 convalescent patients. Um, and this, again, is the work of Antonino, June, uh, um, uh, Lo, and uh, together also with another PhD student, uh, Daniela Vaccherino, and another um, postdoc in the lab, Federico Mele. So here again, uh, we are uh, sorting from uh, patients that recovered from uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, the three subsets that I already introduced to you, central memory, fetal memory, and circulating follicular helper cells. We have been labeling the cells with CFSC and exposing them to the spike or the nucleoprotein of SARS-CoV-2. And uh, maybe there is no surprise to see that, especially at the early time points, there is a very robust, a very strong response against these two antigens in these three memory subsets. Uh, these are many donors uh, in which we were able um, to analyze all three subsets. And this is instead another group of donors where we have analyzed the total memory T cells. And as you can see, is significantly higher compared to uh, T cells reactive to these antigens in non-COVID, non-SARS-CoV-2 exposed donors. Actually, these are um, healthy donors that have been stored and prepared before the, the pandemic. So no, no surprise that there was, there is a very strong response against these two antigens in the T helper cell compartment. Um, the nice thing when, when we, uh, when we 
perform T cell receptor sequencing uh, of the different subsets, uh, and this is uh, depicted in one particular donor, um, we could see that uh, T cells responding to the spike or to the nucleoprotein in the central memory, the factor memory or follicular helper cells have a lot of chronotype sharing. So the same T cell receptor uh, V-beta sequence can be found in central memory, effector memory, and uh, T follicular helper cells. Um, of course, uh, effector memory cells produce also while proliferating a lot of interferon gamma, so they are of the TH1 type, meaning that uh, this uh, um, response induces, uh, a, first of all, a quite a broad range of T cells. As you can see, the number of chronotypes is very, is very high. And also that within the same chronotype, you can have uh, a polyfunctional response inducing both effector T cells, in particular TH1 cells, central memory precursors, as well as um, helper T cells for antibody production. So uh, at that point, we decided to focus the response on the spike and in particular to the receptor binding domain of the spike, because of course, as you know, uh, these are in fact the protein which is used in the currently um, approved vaccines and also in many that are under development. And so to study the specificity of uh, the response to the spike protein, we generated the um, many, many clones. Actually, now we have more than 3,000 clones from, from approximately 35 donors. And, um, and these clones were generated, I, I had to um, stress, by this in vitro simulation with the entire spike protein. So we leave again the antigen presenting cells generating the peptides for presentation. But then once we have the spike reactive T cell clones, we can map the specificity using peptide pools covering the different region of the spike. Uh, so we design uh, peptides which cover the entire S1 domain uh, without the receptor binding domain, which is uh, instead grouped together, and then the S2 domain. And uh, by using uh, these peptide pools covering these three different regions, uh, we could understand whether the response to the spike uh, can be targeted towards one or the other uh, regions. And as you can see in this uh, graph depicting all donors analyzed, uh, all donors are capable of recognizing all three domains, and in particular the RBD. So there are some donors where you don't see RBD reactive uh, chronotypes, but actually we repeated the simulation of these donors with the RBD and RBD reactive T cells are, can indeed be uh, isolated from these donors. So the response to uh, the RBD can be seen in all donors analyzed. Uh, it's a sizable fraction of the response to, um, uh, to the spike. And uh, this suggests that this uh, domain is in fact aliminogenic in vivo. So at that point, we focus on the RBD to understand whether the recognition of the RBD can be, um, what, what is the target the peptides, and again, by screening many uh, T cell clones from many donors, we identified a region that, as you can see, is seen by more than 90% of the donors, and most every donor from whom we have analyzed uh, this particular activity against the RPD can respond to these uh, peptides, or this region of 20 amino acids, uh, suggesting that because of the polymorphisms, uh, these peptides can bind to multiple HLA alleles, and actually they have also uh, I didn't show, I would not show you the data, but we also show that the same uh, peptides, actually two nested peptides in this region can, can bound both DR and the DP molecules. And you see that the very high proportion of these clones are directed against these hotspot or immunodominant peptides within the RBD. But also you can appreciate that RBD can be targeted essentially all uh, in, in all its length. So you have, of course, with diversity in different donors, so depending on, again on the HLA, but the uh, RBD can be, is highly immunogenic and uh, any peptides from the RBD can be in fact uh, um, targeted in different donors. So we identified that this immunodominant region in the RBD, and the question was whether this immunodominant region is due to the expansion of a few clonotypes which are responding to that particular region or whether the response is polyclonal. And again, by sequencing the T cell clones, so here we um, sequenced 245 RBD uh, hotspot specific T cell clones identified 
uh, 162 different chronotypes. So the response, as you can see from donors from whom we have an, uh, identified several uh, clones against this particular hotspot, the response is very polyclonal with very few clones that really become dominant, which is something expected because this is a primary response. So you don't have time to really select and expand a few chronotypes. Still in vivo, if you search for these chronotypes in ex vivo T receptor sequencing, you find that some of these hotspot specific RBD reactive T cell clones are quite abundant in the blood of the uh, patients that we have studied, uh, being among the top 5% of the T cell receptor um, that are circulating in the blood. So the last point that we wanted to ask against the RBD uh, reactivity uh, in SARS-CoV-2 was whether there is um, any possibility to also um, isolate cross-reactive T cells against other coronaviruses. And to do so, we uh, used an approach that we have developed some years ago, um, that is to perform what is called the crisscross or heterologous free stimulation. So we isolate first the spike, SARS-CoV-2 in this case, the reactive T cells, and then we relabel the cells with CFSC, and then we perform a secondary um, stimulation either with the same antigen or with a different antigen, with the aim to enrich for cross-reactive T cells through this secondary stimulation. Um, then, of course, we can isolate the T cell clones, showing that they really are really cross-reactive, and perform T cell receptor sequencing to identify uh, chronotypes which are shared between the two uh, stimulatory antigens. And we did so uh, in the case of spike. And I should say that uh, of the many spike uh, uh, that we tested against uh, from different coronaviruses, it was relatively easy to find, maybe as expected, uh, T cells that responded to the SARS-CoV-2 spike and also to the SARS-CoV spike, but also to another uh, common coronaviruses of the beta family, the UQ1 uh, um, virus. And, uh, it's easy to find uh, T cell clones at this point uh, against that are cross reactive against the SARS CoV 2 and these uh, other viruses. And maybe not surprisingly, some of these clones are specific for the S2, which is in fact uh, maybe the most concerned uh, part of the, of the spike. But actually, you can also identify some uh, RBD reactive cross reactive T cells, both in the SARS CoV 2 and in the UQ1 uh, uh, virus. And some of these uh, are found also in this analysis of the T cell receptor sequencing. Here uh, in green or red are depicted the hotspot specific RBD reactive T cells. So this hotspot seems to be also possibly um, be recognized by T cells, very rare, uh, that can cross react also with common uh, coronaviruses or with SARS CoV 2. So this is a little bit of summary uh, of what I mentioned. Robust CD40 cell response, multiple targets, essentially all the um, SARS-CoV-2 RBD region can be, can be targeted and there, are, there is one particular hotspot uh, that seems to be recognized by eventually all donors that we have analyzed. And the T cell receptor analysis is consistent with the primary response and with a very broad range of repertoire. Uh, let me go now to the second part of the talk, uh, especially talking about the, the function that is associated with the specificity to certain pathogens. And this really goes back to some early observations we had in the lab when studying the response to candida albicans and the identification of TH17 cells as the main memory subset responding to this antigen, but also re the realization that the response to candida is very complex. And in addition to TH17 cells, which certainly are dominant, you can have also TH1, TH2, or this TH1 star responding to candida albicans. So the question we asked at that point, and this was really the work of a, a former PhD student in the lab, Simone Beccatini, who is now a professor in Geneva, um, was whether this heterogeneity is the result of a one cell, so is heterogeneity at the population level, so everyone, every single cell can only give rise to one phage, or whether instead there is a multiple phage um, uh, program, uh, the same cell cap uh, capable of doing um, all uh, different types of, of differentiation pathways. And the work was done more or less with the same type of approach, isolating in this case um, TH1, TH2, uh, TH1 star or TH17 cells based on the combination of chemokine receptors, analyzing 
the T cell receptor sequencing of these cells that, as expected, produce different type of cytokines based on the on the functional properties they have. And uh, the data showing that there is a lot of, of chronotype sharing between TH17 and TH1 star and TH17 and TH2, which was quite, quite surprising. So this uh, work altogether was also uh, doing some in vitro priming experiment to show that this heterogeneity can be even um, uh, imprinted in one single round of simulation from a naive T cell. But altogether, the, the, let's say the, the, the main message of the work that was mainly conducted in the context of the response to candida, but also to mycobacteria, was that there is an unexpected degree of functional heterogeneity of pathogen-specific T cells in humans. So if you study, especially pathogens to which we are continually exposed, um, really the response can be dominated by one particular type, but certainly can be very heterogeneous. And we have uh, demonstrated through this study that this heterogeneity can be interclonal, but also intraclonal. The same uh, T cell uh, receptors of the same specificity uh, can, be, um, can give rise to cells that acquire different phase. And we believe that this heterogeneity can be imprinted early on. Um, and then there are mechanisms that make so that one particular type become dominant. And this may be because maybe the cells have uh, migrated to the right tissues where they are exposed to the antigen, or maybe because there are some survival factors that help them become really the polarizer, the dominant uh, response. So rather than polarization from the beginning, uh, the model that we are suggesting is that there is a selection of a particular type of T cells in response to certain pathogens. So the, the, the question, however, that remains unanswered in the human is whether there is any good reason to have such heterogeneity or whether the, there may be some actually detrimental effects. And uh, you can think that maybe it's good to have a diverse repertoire of T cells, maybe also with different migratory capacity so that the cells can be recruited where necessary. However, you can also think that certain type of effect of T cells are not going to be useful in the fight against a certain pathogen. So you need to have specialized effect of T cell, uh, T -cell responses. So the, 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 the bottleneck question is really whether uh, there is, uh, what is the, uh, the correlate of protection, if you want, if you wish. So whether certain T cell polarization is associated with host protection. And the way to address this question in humans is, is of course, is, is difficult, but really some, a field that is, uh, I think, helping us uh, understanding a lot about human immunologies is the study on, of immunodeficiencies, especially those that are associated with defects in dealing with certain pathogens. And, uh, and the work of many investigators, and in particular, um, Jean-Laurent Casanova's lab, um, has defined a lot of uh, um, molecules that are implicated in so-called interferon gamma immunity, or I-17 immunity, which are important in the response against mycobacteria or um, candida. And, uh, and this is really comes from the studies of patients that develop um, in, with inborn errors of immunity that uh, develop uh, um, infections uh, through these, uh, to these pathogens. So uh, more recently, um, a postdoc in Jean-Laurent's lab, uh, Ray Young, has done a beautiful beautiful work in um, identifying and characterizing a patient with a TBET deficiency and interferon gamma uh, immunity defect against the mycobacteria. So the patient um, is, uh, is suf uh, suffered from mycobacterial disease and, uh, and the underlying uh, genetic defect was uh, identified in the TBET uh, gene. Uh, as you know, the uh, TBET is defining, is a, an important lineage defining transcription factors regulating interferon gamma in many cell types, including Th1 cells. It also controls expression of the chemokine receptor associated with Th1, CXL3. And the, pa the patient, uh, the mutation in the patient in TBET has applicated DNA binding. Uh, the, the, T, the mutated TBET has lost its trans transactivation activity and it failed to induce interferon gamma production in NK cells and also in primary CD8, uh, CD4 positive T cells. And so it's a loss of function allele and the, the work has been again recently published in, uh, in cell. So we helped uh, um, Ray uh, studying this patient uh, in, in terms of uh, the um, antigen specific uh, T cell response and we used uh, the the um, T cell library approach, we isolated from the patient two subsets of memory T cells, those that are um, expressing CCR6 or not, and this would define the two groups that are more enriched in the 
mycobacteria specific, uh, the TH1 star subset and the TH17 or the TH1, the classic and the TH2. And then we uh, addressed uh, using the library, we performed the high throughput screening of the memory response in this patient against a variety of antigens. And when compared to, um, to the response to a wild type control or to heterozygous relatives, uh, you see that um, the donor, that the patient can respond to influenza virus in terms of having T cells responding to influenza virus or to Epstein Barr virus. So there is a response to these antigens. However, in contrast to the healthy donors or to the heterozygous, the patient cannot mount interferon gamma response against the viral antigen. There was instead a surprise that the patient mounted also a very strong response to mycobacterial antigens as expected, but in this case, the T cells were able to produce interferon gamma. And the only difference being that um, the cells, in addition to interferon gamma, uh, the BCG reactive T cells also produce uh, interleukin 17, which is not seen in the, in the controls. So overall, there is a defect in interferon gamma, yet some um, T cells can make uh, uh, can produce interferon gamma in the context of Tibet deficiency. So how is possible? So we, at that point, um, um, we ask a more general question, how can T cells differentiate to become interferon gamma producers in the context of Tibet deficiency? And to study that, uh, uh, Mark Weiser, a student in Zurich, uh, performed, uh, used it three different types of approach. They performed single cell RNA sequencing ex vivo of CD4 T cells taken out from the blood of the patient. He again isolated many T cell clones to perform analysis, including AVAC-seq, and then used the CRISPR-Cas9 technology to knock out the genes, and then use also our expression system with lentiviruses to perform some mechanistic studies. So um, no surprise that when you do single cell RNA seq of the patient compared to the control, interferon gamma gene is the uh, gene um, uh, that is more differentially expressed, uh, being of course very very low in in the patient. Still, uh, if you gate on and if you search for interferon gamma positive cells ex vivo after just a short stimulation of a few hours in vitro, you see that you can detect very few T cells that in vivo can produce interferon gamma. And some of these cells have a level of a mRNA, which is comparable to the wild type. So what type of, uh, of uh, genes do these uh, uh, cells that express the very few that express interferon gamma in the patient uh, uh, express? And among the genes which are differentially expressed in the interferon gamma producing cells, we identify the number. And of course, the one attracted our attention, which is amosodermin. You see that amosodermin is expressed in the high frequency of cells that produce interferon gamma in the patient. To further confirm that homeosodermine is indeed um, expressed at higher level in interferon gamma producing T cells uh, in the context of Tibet deficiency, we isolated interferon gamma producing cells from the patient and controls using the cytokine secretion assay to have live cells. You see that when you perform single cell RNA seq, you have a very nice enrichment in interferon gamma producing cells, even if there are very few to start with. And at that point, both of the cells which come from the CCR6 positive, so the TH1 star and the TH1 um, classic cells, they both have homeosodermine together with other genes, but both have homeosodermine as different, more, much more expressed uh, compared to uh, the wild type control. So mesodermine maybe was not a big surprise to find it because it is known that it is a paralog of Tibet and is sufficient to induce, for instance, in mouse CD80 cells interferon gamma, as well as other um, genes which are associated with cytotoxic T cells. In the case of humans, um, there are data already showing that uh, mesodermine can be important in favoring the phenotype switch from TH17 towards the non-classic TH1 star cells. And also some more recent work uh, showing that this amosodermine can promote the differentiation of uh, tier one cells, so cells that produce interferon gamma and interleukin 10. So the, the, we uh, addressed the question whether uh, T cell clones express amosodermine. We isolated T cell clones uh, from the patient and the control. Uh, from the patient, we are able to isolate both. Uh, uh, interferon gamma null and interferon gamma high T cell clones. And there is, a, as you see, a very nice correlation between the ability to produce interferon gamma and the expression at the level of protein of hemosodermine. Although, as you can see here, there are also some, cell, also some cells that produce interferon gamma and do not express hemosodermine. 
So we did also have XIC, no surprise, that the interferon gamma locus in the interferon gamma high sense is open, is, is accessible, as in wild type sense, while it's closed in the interferon gamma negative T cell clones. And we are using this data to define motifs, which again point to hemosidermin um, as a likely candidate for the, um, for the induction of interferon gamma in the absence of uh, Tibet in human T cells. So the question is whether um, amesodermin is sufficient to induce interferon gamma. And, um, and uh, for that reason, we um, expressed, uh, we produced two different uh, lentiviral vectors uh, to express amesodermin in clones which are Tibet deficient, but also are interferon gamma negative, to ask whether the uh, addition of amesodermin is sufficient to uh, trigger interferon gamma production. And as you can see here, this is in fact the case uh, for on those, by gating on those that have a mesodermin expression using the reporter, you see that uh, almost 80% of the T cells acquire the ability to produce interferon gamma when eomesodermin is provided. So the, the opposite question is whether if uh, you delete eomesodermin, this would affect interferon gamma production in the Tibet deficient cells. And that came a bit the surprise that in spite of a very good deletion of hemosodermin using the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, there is no um, problem in, in the T cell clones to continue to produce interferon gamma. And at that point, uh, um, I need to, to make a little summary of this part. So first of all, the rare interferon gamma mRNA positive cells can be detected as vivo in the patient that is deficient in Tibet. These uh, um, cells overexpress uh, hemosodermin, and the uh, hemosodermin overexpression is sufficient to induce interferon gamma production. However, deletion of hemosodermin in human cells that, that are capable of producing interferon gamma in the context of Tibet deficiency is not impairing their ability to continue to produce interferon gamma. And uh, I need to remind you that um, the T cell differentiation process is really a, a rather let's say, progressive uh, process uh, that um, uh, generates terminally differentiated cells as well as intermediates. And during this differentiation, the requirements for transcription factors may differ. So the question we ask whether um, Tibet or mesodermin in our case is required uh, is not required that we have shown in, the, in maybe in already differentiated uh, Th1 cells in vivo, but maybe is required in the early steps of T cell differentiation. And for that reason, we used uh, naive T cells from the patient and primed them in vitro uh, using MTB as an antigen. And uh, as you can see here, uh, by comparing the priming of naive T cells from uh, Tibet deficient patients and the wild type control, um, the cells can be very nicely polarized towards TH1 interferon gamma producing cells in the wild type. And of course, the patient has much more limited differentiation capacity. Still, uh, some interferon gamma producing cells can be induced in this in vitro priming system. Uh, the cells from the wild type control uh, express high level of Tibet as expected. The patient is negative for Tibet. And nicely, there are some cells that co express your mesodermin in the wild type, but all the cells that are primed in vitro um, by MTB in the patient express uh, and produce interferon gamma, they all express your mesodermin. So now we took these cells and we, um, we eliminated the uh, mesodermin to ask whether this was sufficient to reduce the interferon gamma producing capacity. And this, in fact, was the case. You see that in the controls, um, the interferon gamma is still there in a reasonable good amount. Uh, when you knock out the mesodermin, you lose many cell types capable of producing interferon gamma. There are a few still there. Maybe they've already acquired the independence from mesodermin as the um, memory T cells. It's also interesting to see that even in the wild type controls, there is a reduction of interferon gamma producing T cells, meaning that maybe also in the context of Tibet sufficiency, humans can play a role in TH1 differentiation in humans. So the, first, the final uh, message of this study is that in the early stages of T-cell differentiation, hemosodermin is required to induce or to maybe to maintain interferon gamma production in the context of Tibet deficiency, but possibly also in the context of Tibet sufficient uh, naive T-cells. And I think this was just only one example of how studies of patients with deficiency in, in genes which are important in T-cell differentiation are 
first of all, key to understand the role of certain pathways in conferring host protection, but also can help us understand the mechanism and pathways of T-cell differentiation in humans. And this, of course, can be highly facilitated nowadays uh, through the uh, possibility of uh, um, making uh, gene knockout or, or gene engineering through the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And we are really very grateful to the possibility of collaborating with Jean-Laurent Casanova and Puel and Jacinta Bustamante in the study of these patients and what they can reveal us in terms of human immunology and the response to pathogens. And with this, I close. I hope it was not too long. Um, I need to make, to, as you imagine, this is the work of many people in the lab. Uh, the lab is split in two sites, uh, one in Bellinzona and one in Zurich. Um, Mark Weiser in Zurich, together with uh, the help of Samuel and Ottermaltor and other people in the lab, has done a lot of work in the Tibet deficient patients. And then, uh, the first work I showed you uh, on, uh, on the influenza was the work of Antonino Cassotta. And really the, the work on, on SARS-CoV-2 that as you can imagine has really made um, for, has changed dramatically our, our way of working in the lab um, is really the work of again Antonino together with another great postdoc in the lab, uh, Jun Lo, uh, Federico made another postdoc and the, the young PhD student uh, Daniela Vaccherino. Uh, all this work would not have been not possible through the great collaborations. Uh, I mentioned Jean-Laurent Casanova, a young and the group in Paris. And I want to thank also the clinicians here in Ticino uh, that have been very keen to help us uh, collecting samples from patients, from healthcare workers, from nursing homes to do all our studies on, on SARS-CoV-2. And I have at least uh, pictures of three members of the lab so that you see also their face, their uh, wonderful people, and I, I want to really take the opportunity to thank all, uh, all of the lab members because I know that this has been difficult times for all uh, the people working in the lab. It is amazing that in spite of all these difficulties, they are, uh, continue to work very hard, very passionate, and, um, and it's, it's wonderful to see them uh, doing so well. Uh, and I think I stop here and I will be happy to take any question. Federica, thank you so much. This was a fascinating uh, talk. Uh, yeah, you know, really showing it well. again, groundbreaking discoveries. And, uh, and thank you so much for sharing your unpublished work. I, I, we appreciate it. I'm sure the audience appreciate it as well. And um, I think Carla uh, will, will indicate now how to ask questions uh, via Twitter. And so we will uh, meet you again there in Twitter. Yeah. Very good. Thank you Thank so you. much, Federica. That was wonderful. Yes, as we always do, let me just remind you uh, before the next announcement that Federica will be able to answer questions via Twitter. There's already a tweet that you can find that says, ask questions for Federica Salusto seminar here. So please, if you have questions, reply to that tweet with your question. And do not forget to mention at Global Immuno. And in this case, Federica is going to make use of her own Twitter account. So please also refer to the Salusto uh, lab. So uh, we have reached uh, the end uh, of 2020. This has been a very difficult year, but a very special year in which uh, I personally have felt connected with so many of you that I don't personally know, but through this forum. So it is my real pleasure to announce to you that we will continue with Global Immunotalks in 2021. Now, when Elina and I were thinking about how to continue uh, the Global Immunotalks, we really thought that it was very important to diversify the organizers uh, to more effectively represent and reach the global immunology community. So with this, I am truly delighted uh, to announce Global Immunotalks 2021, which will be co-organized by all the people that you can see in this slide. So uh, we have other new co-organizers like Enrique Vega Fernandez from Portugal, Florent Ginou from Singapore, Nicola Harris from Australia, and Matteo Iannacone from Italy. And I am 
delighted to say that Matteo is joining us today. So let's see, Matteo, if we can uh, welcome you to this uh, forum. So I think, yes, it's working and you are unmuted. So welcome, Matteo. We're very honored to have you join us in this program. Hello, everyone, and, uh, and uh, thank you. And uh, let me start by congratulating uh, Carla and Elina for really putting together a fantastic uh, seminar series. I think this allows us the large immunological community to stay close and connected in these difficult and challenging times. And so in as much as I look forward to the time where we can safely resume uh, in-person interactions, I think this is as good as it gets. So really kudos uh, to Carla and Elena for this. Thank you, Matteo. And of course, all this group has already been working. So I will uh, go to the next slide and Matteo will tell us about what's happening next. Okay, here it goes. Yeah, so I'm grateful and very excited to co-organize next year's uh, global uh, immunotalks. And uh, I think we uh, were able to put together uh, a stellar lineup of uh, speakers, as you can see here. I think uh, we've covered a wide variety of topics in immunology. Uh, it's an exciting time to be an immunologist, so I really hope that you uh, will enjoy the seminars and engage in the discussions uh, following the talks. I think also we've uh, managed to uh, uh, keep, uh, you know, the geographic and uh, gender and uh, ethnic representation as much as we could. So I'm uh, very much excited uh, for next year's talks. And um, I wish okay. um, happy holidays uh, to everyone and, uh, and uh, back to you, Carla. Yes, thank you so much, Matteo. Thank you. We're delighted to share the third poster of the Global Immunotox. And now I will go to the next slide and my friend Alina will close uh, this series of 2020. Yes, thank you, Carly. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Matteo, as well, for joining us today and for all your hard work uh, together with the other co-organizers. I, I'd like just to close with a few minutes uh, uh, thanking uh, everyone involved and uh, um, uh, especially uh, Carla, uh, you know, uh, it has been a, a, a fantastic journey and uh, uh, Carla's passion, drive, creativity make uh, for me this experience uh, very uh, a, a enjoyable and, and fulfilling. And so she's a dear friend, but I, just, I really wanna say uh, that it would not have been possible at all to uh, a, a, a undertake this initiative uh, without Carla's hard work and positive attitude, optimism, passion. And so, so uh, thank you uh, so much. I, I also uh, would like to thank again all the speakers for 2020. We have been doing it every, every session but also the speakers for the 2021 that have agreed so uh, graciously uh, to, to uh, present in this uh, series. And, and of course, the, the co-organizer, uh, Matteo, Nicola, Florent, Enrique, for all the hard work and, and for agreeing to join us uh, in this initiative. And uh, finally, I would like to thank all of uh, the, the attendees and audience of the Global Immuno Talks. Uh, I cannot explain, and, and Carla, uh, I know she shared this uh, with, with feelings with me. I cannot explain how fulfilling it has been uh, to receive uh, the numerous personal messages, the tweets uh, from immunologists across the world. Um, so we really appreciate uh, your support and also your help to distribute uh, uh, the posters and spread the word. Please keep doing it. Um, so the, the reception has been amazing. Uh, now we have uh, uh, over 8,000 uh, people registered to the Zoom webinars. Uh, there are hundreds of attendees joining the live seminars. Uh, we had up to 2,000 in the first talks uh, and uh, a, also thousands of views in YouTube. We have some uh, a, a, a videos that have been uh, viewed by over 6,000 people. And so we really appreciate uh, the reception from the immunology community and also the support uh, throughout this year. So thank you so much and happy holidays to all of you. Thanks everybody, we'll see you in 2021. Thanks Federica again for the wonderful talk. Thanks Mateo. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you, bye.
Bye.